Well, good morning. This uh, is both a very exciting and also a very challenging time for our church family. Uh, we are facing many different pressures together. Our founding pastor has retired after 36 years of ministry and not only do we lose the benefits of his gifts and abilities being expressed to the same degree that we have up until now, there's also a sense of consistency and, and stability that can feel lost when somebody of Tom's uh, stature steps down. We also find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic, and this is having huge impact on churches all over the country. In fact, you may not know this, but there's a study that predicts that one out of every five churches in America is going to close its doors because of COVID-19. And that's not because everyone in the church is going to die because of the virus. And it's not because everyone is going to lose their jobs so the church goes bankrupt and can't keep the lights on. It's because Christians in these places are so divided on various issues that are going on in our culture right now that they are no longer able to move forward in a united way. And eventually what's happening is these churches are simply falling apart. Think about that. One in five churches in every community of the United States there uh, is evidence that a large number of pastors have either quit or are planning to quit the ministry. Uh, it's just too stressful. You probably recognize this, but decision-making in churches right now is brutal. There are simply no good options that are available for church leaders. And many pastors do not have the support of elders and, and staff like ours who are so wonderful and people like you who are so flexible and giving. Since we shut down in, in March, I cannot tell you how many people, even just this morning, have said to me or have said to us, listen, we're praying for you guys in this. We, we know it's hard. If there's anything that we can do, let us know. We're here to help. I want you to understand there are so many pastors who do not have those kinds of leaders and who do not have those kinds of congregations, and my heart aches for them. Society in general, obviously, is so divisive right now. People seem to actually want to think the worst of one another. They seem to enjoy the fight. And the fact that we're in an election season is like the icing on the cake. Our society is being tested right now in ways that we have never seen before. And trials and difficulties like these can tear people apart. They can tear apart friendships. They can tear apart marriages. They can tear apart families. And they can even tear apart churches, too. And I catch myself wondering some, some days when all of this passes and, and eventually it is going to pass. Life is going to get back to normal again. But I catch myself wondering, where will our church be? How will our church have changed? Who are we going to become together? Will these experiences have significantly weakened our unity and the strength of our mission together? Or will God use these trials in each of our lives to deepen our faith and to deepen the ties of our relationships with one another and to reignite a fire in us to want to love and serve this community for Christ? You see, a trial can tear people apart, but it also has the power to bring them together like never before. In an extended family, when somebody becomes seriously ill, let, let's say a mother is diagnosed with cancer. If that extended family pulls together to love and serve her, 
to provide meals and to cover medical bills and to watch her kids after school and to drive her to doctor's appointments, if the members of that family step up and make sacrifices for the good of that woman that they love, then in the end, it's not just mom who gets blessed. It's everyone. The whole dynamic in that family is changed forever. Every relationship is strengthened and deepened in ways that never would have happened otherwise if mom hadn't gotten cancer. A trial can tear, but it can also mend people together. It, it can build up and it can unify and enrich a family. And the same thing absolutely goes for church families too. I've been asked several times in the last few months, uh, in light of COVID-19, if I still want to be the lead pastor. And, and it's not that I'm not stressed out by that responsibility or, or, or feel the weight of it at times, but my answer has been and still is, are you kidding me? Absolutely I do. Of course I do. What an opportunity this moment is for us. And I want to be here at the end of it all. Because I want to see the good fruit that I believe the Lord is going to produce in this and through this in all of us, myself included. I want to see what he's going to do in me. This is a wonderful time to be a pastor. And this is such an exciting time in history to be a devoted Christian who is seeking to grow in his or her faith and to be committed to a local church family. And if you or I allow these trials to tear us away from the Lord in any way or to cause us to give in to the fear and the angst which is spreading like wildfire in our society, or to separate ourselves from our Christian brothers and sisters over preferences or politics, as many churches are experiencing, then we risk missing out on the benefits of deeper unity and richer maturity that I fully believe in every way that these trials will bring. I want to show you a couple of things, three things actually, in this wonderful passage. I'm not so much preaching a sermon this morning as I feel like I'm acting like a tourist on a sightseeing trip. I'm pointing my finger at something amazing and beautiful and saying, I want you to just see how wonderful this is. What I want you to do is to look at this passage and I want to show you three benefits that come when, as the author says here, we are grieved by various trials. Trials that grieve us. What are the benefits? There's three of them. And I hope this passage deeply encourages and motivates all of us, me included, as we head into the fall together. Three things. First, this is going to tell us that trials test the genuineness of our faith. Okay, look at the passage. First, we're shown what that faith is meant to be, what, what it's rooted in. Look at verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's where our faith begins and ends. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. That's salvation. To a living hope. Through the great mercy. Excuse me. According to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept for you in heaven, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Next, he's going to tell us what we're supposed to do with this. Verse 6, in this you rejoice. In other words, Peter looks back and says, this is awesome. What we've been given, we rejoice in. But look what he says next. 
In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So Peter says, rejoice, however, temporarily, when necessary, you and I will face trials that are going to grieve us. Why? Well, he answers that in verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We face trials, Peter says, so that the genuineness of our faith might be tested. You and I will never know how strong we are until we try to lift a heavy weight. We might think that we're up for it, or we might think that we're not up for it. God uh, allows us to face trials so that we can see whether or not our faith is the real deal. If it's real faith, it holds up under trial. If it isn't, it crumbles like a sandcastle. That's what Peter is saying. In other words, trials are self-revealing. They tend to expose both the strengths and the weaknesses of our faith. We all have both. And they give us the opportunity to see the best that is inside of us and the worst that's inside of us. Uh, you and I are like glasses of water that are filled to the brim, but, but we can't see what's inside of us very easily. And a trial is like when something bumps against us and whatever is inside of us, like water, splashes out in front of us. And it's only then that we can see clearly what's inside of us. Trials, if we'll pay attention to them, give us the opportunity to see whatever it is that's inside of us when it spills over. And you'll notice in life that sometimes you'll go through something really hard and you'll surprise yourself by how well you handled it. And, and you'll thank God because you know that five years ago you couldn't have done that. And you think, wow, God is, is growing me up. Thank you, God. You are at work in my life. Other times, a trial will expose how weak or how sinful you are. And, and you'll need to come to God for his grace and forgiveness. And you know what you'll find? He'll give you his grace and his forgiveness because he loves you and Jesus died for you and you receive that and you rejoice and it inspires you to move forward with new energy and hope. So either way, whatever spills out of you is a new opportunity to draw closer to God from one direction or the other. Well, this year has been an opportunity for all of us to be stretched. So let me ask you this. What surprising things have you learned about yourself so far? How have these things helped you to move towards the heart of God? And what else does God have in store for you and me this fall? Every Christian should want to grow to be more like Christ. And God knows that the first step in that is often a trial to reveal to us the genuineness of our faith. It's how we know what we ought to thank God for. And it's how we know those things that we need to ask him to be at work on inside of us. That's the first thing that Peter says here. Trials expose the genuineness of our faith. Second of all, what he says is that trials also refine our faith. They burn away our shallowness and our lethargy. They're meant to revive our spiritual intensity. Take a look again at verses 6 and 7. Peter says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We all, every one of us, have such a tendency to take our faith for granted. We don't realize or recognize how 
awesome the power and promises of the gospel are in our lives. How stable and secure and loved we are by God. But when the times get tough, and you and I know this, our faith becomes so much more precious and powerful in our lives, doesn't it? You see, the Christian faith operates best when it is under intense pressure. Uh, both the Bible and Christian history show us that when the Christian faith is persecuted, it thrives. Uh, do you know what the two countries are today with the highest evangelical growth in the world? Number one is Iran, and number two is Afghanistan. Highest rate of evangelical growth in both of those countries. These are both places where Christians are being intensely persecuted. Now, do you know where America, with all of our beautiful church buildings and our resources and our programs and our funding, sits on that list? We're number 30. Number 30. Nations like China and Mongolia and Cambodia are light years ahead of us. Why is that? It's because Christianity shines so brilliantly under the heat and pressure of a trial. And the more you seek to extinguish it, the brighter it burns. However, if it gets comfortable for too long, it begins to cool and it starts to grow pale and colorless and its brilliance begins to fade. And when Christians start to put their hope not in what Peter says here, the imperishable, the undefiled and un fading inheritance that is being kept for them in heaven, but in life being smooth and comfortable here, then the transforming power of their faith is wasted. Uh, my wife and I gave my son something called the Action Bible for his birthday this year. It's actually a comic book Bible that has action-packed stories in it. Now, there was a warning online that said, be careful who you give this to because it's a little intense. And my wife and I laughed and we said, well, perfect. Jack is going to love this. And when we got it, I looked it over and I thought, wow, they were not kidding. And it reminded me that there is some really ugly stuff in the Bible. In fact, you know, the Bible is not a story of God's people hanging out pleasantly and comfortably and peacefully. It's the story of God's people, one after another, facing tremendous pressure in a broken world and a Savior who comes to suffer right along with them. In fact, a Savior who comes to suffer right along for them. And it is both through and in spite of this suffering that all of these people are brought to glory. One of the things that I've made a point, and my wife has too, with our kids at home, is that following Christ will be the best decision that they will ever make. But that it will also be the hardest thing that they will ever do. We tell them again and again, it won't be easy. Sometimes it's going to get really ugly to teach a child that if they just trust Christ, everything will be fine is a sure way to shipwreck their faith. Because when that kid turns 13 and gets heartbroken by a girl who rejects his invitation to the school dance, he'll wonder, why didn't God come through? What happened? I'm a Christian. Life isn't supposed to work this way. But if we teach our children that part of being a Christian means that sometimes, like Peter says here, God is going to allow you to encounter trials that feel way too heavy for you. But following Christ is still worth it. And God will use those trials in your life for your good so that 
when those trials come, and they will, and they'll be ugly, at least the kid isn't surprised by them. If you build into them a theology of suffering, maybe they won't get so frustrated and disappointment and disappointed when that suffering actually happens. You see, Jesus promised us trials. He was the one who said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Christian life by design is a life of cross-bearing. And I really believe that America is number 30 on the list because we've lost sight of that. And that's why American churches experience such little fruit and joy. In Iran, when a person's faith is being persecuted, that's dangerous. But in America, when a person's faith is allowed to just sit comfortably, that is absolutely deadly. When we deny ourselves and bear our crosses, the power of the gospel is unleashed in our lives. And God uses our trials to burn away our spiritual shallowness and lethargy and to revive our spiritual intensity. And what he ultimately does, this says, is he refines our faith. Now, there's one more thing I want us to see here. It's found in verses 8 through 9. Peter writes, though you have not seen him, you love him, right? A trial is going to require faith. We can't see God in a trial, but he says you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice. There's that word again, with joy. There it is again, that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, the outcome, Peter says, the end result of a trial that is faithfully endured is primarily here two things. Love for God, and secondly, joy, he says, that is inexpressible. I only have time this morning to consider one of those things. Got to pick between love and joy. It's a tough one, but I pick joy. Joy is the experience that all of us long for in life. In fact, it's the experience I believe we long for most of all. We were built for joy. But we find it so elusive in our lives. And that's because Christian joy, just like in this passage, it comes at the end. Christian joy is found almost exclusively as a byproduct of a trial that has been faithfully endured. If you read through the Bible, you'll see how, offering, how often suffering and joy are paired together. Almost always, if you read about joy, you're also reading about suffering, as is the case in this passage. And what the Bible seems to teach is that if you want to experience joy, you've got to walk through the valley first. And if you won't walk through the valley, which is up to you, you don't necessarily have to, but no joy at the end. If you ask almost any of our students, our high school students, when the last time was that they felt that they really experienced joy, I mean true joy in their faith, I bet you that 90% of them will say that it was on one of our mission trips. I bet you they will. Ask, ask a high school student. Let me tell you, one of the things that we do with students on those trips, we walk them through the valley. That's part of what those trips are all about. Months in advance before the trip, we sit them down and prepare them, and we tell them that these trips are not meant to be a vacation. We tell them they're meant to be a chance to grow closer to the Lord, to grow closer to one another, and to serve people who could really use our service. And then we tell them that they don't have to go, but if they want to go, there's going to be seven things that we're going to ask them to give up on their trip. And we call them the seven C's. They all start with the letter C. There's seven of them. 
We've been sharing this list of seven C's with students literally for 20 years. Sometimes I've acted it out in a skit back in the days. I wrote a song on, when I used to play guitar called Sailing the Seven Seas, and I sang these things to the students. Every single student walks through this list. Here's what it is. These are things we're going to ask them to give up. Number one, comfort. Number two, complaining. Number three, convenience. Number four, couch potato syndrome. Number five, comedy. Uh, no inside jokes with on, on one another, sarcasm, pranks, things like that. Number six, conceit. And number seven, control. And we talk about what that will mean under each of these categories. But when we take a kid on a mission trip, we want to stretch them. We're going to ask them to work hard. We're going to try to separate the cliques so they can get to know new people. We want them to be challenged. And we try to give them the experience of what the pursuit of God and Christian community and sacrificial service to other people is all about. And with a student, wherever you set the bar, that's how high they're going to jump. If you set it here, they'll make it over it. If you set it here... It's going to be a challenge, but when you set it high, it is amazing to see what happens when you watch them leap. One time, we were in downtown Indianapolis, and this was years ago, 15, 18 years ago. We were working to rehab a home so that a homeless single mom and her kids could move into it. And the person who was coordinating the project for us gathered us together to assign jobs. And he said, well, the, the first job that I have is down in the basement. And I got to warn you, he said, it's really a messy one. He said, I'm going to need a couple of people who are really tough. And I remember we were standing around in the circle, and there's these big, strong high school guys. And every one of them put their heads down and their eyes straight at the floor. Until finally, this one ninth or tenth grade girl, she said, I'll do it. And her friend said, yeah, I'll do it too. And their names were Jesse and Megan. And so off they went down into the basement. And I got the other groups together, and I, I, I remember a little while later, I was coming down the, the stairs to check on them, and as I walked down, I could hear them singing praise songs. And they were laughing, and they were working so hard. And when I got down, they looked absolutely disgusting. There's a picture somewhere of these two covered in dirt and grime, but they were having a ball. They, they were rejoicing. And I bet that if you ask these two what one of the highlights of their life was, they would say, working down there on that disgusting project in the basement so that this mom and her family could have a home. Because down there, what they experienced was joy. Joy. One of the reasons our mission trips are so impacting is that they give our students, in, in, in many cases for the first time, a real experience of joy. And we hope that what will happen is they'll get a taste for that joy and want to pursue it the rest of their lives. But to find it, we teach them that their life cannot be about them alone. Otherwise, real joy will always be elusive. Real joy is not found in having our desires met. It is found in denying ourselves for the sake of others. It's not found in the full expression of personal freedom. Can't find joy there. It's found in sacrificial service to God and to neighbor. And we teach them that if they want to be a Christian who experiences joy, they cannot run away from the hard stuff in life. Because the road to joy always begins with a willingness to walk down the stairs into life's basement. Please don't miss this point. Ironically, in the upside-down ways of the gospel, 
God allows trials into our lives to eventually lead us to joy. Can you imagine that? Now, I said that I wanted to give a little vision for this fall. Here it is. It's this passage. My vision for the fall, and I hope your vision for the fall, is joy. I want you to experience real joy this fall, and I want to experience it too. And I believe that the timing for that could not be better. Because this passage teaches us that if you want to find joy, it's probably going to begin with a trial. And guess what? We have one. We're in one. And then it says that if you let it, that trial will reveal to you the genuineness of your faith. You will have an opportunity to see the best in yourself and the worst in yourself. And so will I. But then, if you let him, God will show you his power. And he will use it to burn away your spiritual shallowness. And to revive the spiritual intensity that I hope you long for. And ultimately to refine your faith. So, that at the end of that process, there waiting for you will be just a small taste a small taste of the joy that this passage promises you that God has stored up for you in his heavenly kingdom for all of eternity. This fall, we're going to pursue that joy. In fact, uh, beginning the week after next, we're going to start a series where we will be studying each week the book of Philippians. Guess what the central theme of the book of Philippians is? Wow, you guys are smart. Paul wrote this book on joy in all places. Not in a library, in a prison. He wrote the book from a prison cell. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can glean some things from his experience and his example. Well, let me just conclude with this. Uh, last week, if you were here, you know that during his sermon, Tom uh, shared some words with me. You probably heard uh, those words. Afterwards, people said to me, those were great words. He said, I, I bet those made you feel really good. And the truth is, no, those words didn't make me feel really good. Those words made me feel responsible. The, those words made me feel like, wow, the bar is high, and the church is really going to need my best. That's what I'm asking of you this fall. Our church family is going to need your best. This is going to be a challenging season for us in some ways, because things are going to have to look a little different for us for a little while. Now, thankfully, this is nothing like what Christians are experiencing in places like Iran and Afghanistan. We've got to keep these things in perspective. But that doesn't mean that it's not a challenge. What I want to do for you is I want to set the bar high. I want you to have this fall the mentality of a mission trip because the truth is that's what all of life is. And I believe with all my heart that the kind of people that this passage describes is the kind of people that you and I are seeking to be. And I want to seek to be this with you this fall. And I believe that into the joy of faithful service to Christ is where we're all heading together. Let's pray. Father, you are such a good God who is so loving and so powerful. Only you would be good enough to us and powerful enough for us so that none of our suffering, 
None of our trials, none of our discomfort in life, none of the phone calls that come at 2 o'clock in the morning with bad news, nothing that, that, that brings us anxiety that we read in the paper, nothing, no trial has to be wasted. You are working in our lives to bring all things for good. Oh, Father, I know that I am so often resistant to that. I don't like to be uncomfortable. I do everything that I can often to avoid it. But sometimes you bring things in and I just can't wiggle out of it. And I guess that's your grace because there's things in me you want me to see and there's things in me that you want me to do and ultimately you are bringing the kind of joy that you have had for all eternity into my life. Oh, Father, we want to love you like this passage says, even though we can't see you yet. We want to have joy like this passage says, even though we know it's going to involve trial. Would you be at work in us this fall? Would you protect our unity would you allow our mission together, instead of to be weakened or reduced, to be strengthened in every way? Father, at the end of this year, 2020, instead of looking back and saying, oh, what a horrible year, oh, may we say that was a year that God did things in me. And God did things in us that he never would have done otherwise. I didn't particularly care for that year. But that year was good for my soul. Father, may we come to bless you at the end of this year. And may we, may we bless you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, many of you have been asking, uh, what's the plan for getting back into the building? And I want to thank you so much for being patient uh, as the elders have uh, considered these things. And I want to share with you our plan this morning. Uh, you're going to receive a, an email, Grace Vine email uh, this week, and also a snail mail letter, which will also outline them. Uh, but I'm going to try to answer a few questions this morning, and then myself, and I'm sure some of the elders will be around after the service. You're free to give comment. You're free to ask us anything that you would, uh, you would like. First of all, how did we make this decision? Well, our goal was to put a plan in place that was driven not out of fear, but out of love and wisdom for our congregation. Uh, we want to allow for as many possible people at our church to attend the church in person. And we also wanted to develop a plan that gives us the best chance of being able to continue to hold in-person services into the fall. It is so important for us to be back in our building together with as much normalcy as possible. We want to get in there and we want to sing and we want to pray and we want to listen to teaching and we want to celebrate communion again and have baptisms and fellowship with one another. We want to plan where we can offer uh, classes for every age group and we want to be able to fire up some of the ministries like community groups and buddy break and, and others that have kind of been uh, weakened uh, during this time. God has given our church a big mission, and so what we wanted to do was to create a plan that allows us to move forward in that mission, hopefully without missing a beat. So the elders really tried to do our homework. We looked at scripture, we talked to other pastors, we read and spoke to health professionals. We called uh, more than 15 churches in our area just on the phone to ask them about their reopening plans. We polled our congregation. We talked to local schools. If there was a newspaper story or an article about church reopenings from whatever perspective, there's a good chance that I read it. And the elders spent more hours than you can shake a stick at in meetings. I mean, literally, if you tried to shake a stick during one of our meetings, but by the end, you would not be able to shake that stick. You'd be too tired. 
What we ultimately tried to do was we tried to seek the Lord and listen carefully for his leading. And ultimately, we took on the responsibility to design a plan that honors him, that serves our mission, and that takes into account the various needs of our church as best we can. There is no such thing as an ideal plan. So we are not presenting this plan as our ideal. And we recognize that this plan is not going to please everybody. However, the elders have unanimously agreed that this is the wisest path for us to move forward in for now. Everybody wave. Number two, how long is this reopening plan in place? We are putting this plan into place for the next three months. Okay, this is how long we've designed this to last, three months. Towards the end of that time, we're going to evaluate it and make changes as necessary moving forward. So this isn't forever. Now, we might need to make adjustments along the way, but we're hoping that these things will serve us through the fall. So what will our services look like? Well, beginning next Sunday, we are going to be hosting two services at our usual time of 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. Then we're going to be adding a third service at the most popularly requested time of 8 o'clock a.m. So there will be three services, one at 8 a.m., one at 9.30 a.m., and one at 11.15. There will be children's and student programming for all ages. Nursery and toddler care is going to return. However, it will be limited to the 9.30 service for now. We hope that we can add that at the 1115 service at some later time, but nursery and toddler will be 930 for now. Other classes are going to take place at their normal times. And if you have a student or a child, someone's going to be in touch with you this week to get you more details. They've got great plans for things like social distancing and things like that. For those who are either not able or not ready to join us in person, we're going to be live streaming both the 930 and the 1115 services on Facebook and also on YouTube each week. And that video is going to remain online. So you can always watch it later in the day if you're not able to catch it live. What precautions will we be taking? Well, for your safety and, and for the safety of other people, we're going to continue to not do things like passing an offering basket or serve coffee or snacks or distribute Bibles. You should plan to bring your own. Hand sanitizer is going to be available, and we're going to be sanitizing surfaces before and in between each of our services. We're asking everyone to please observe social distancing guidelines of six feet. And if you're sick, we love you but please stay home. Uh, in the auditorium, in order to allow for distancing, we've removed 50% of our chairs, and you are free to sit wherever you like. However, we'll ask you to please leave three chairs between you and other parties. Now, that obviously excludes your family members, and, and if there's other people in the church that you're already in close contact with, let's say there's a couple and you're spending time at their house and they're spending time at your house anyway, then, then that's okay too. Since this means that our seating capacity is going to be limited in the auditorium, we are going to utilize the impact room and other rooms as video overflow locations where additional seating is going to be available if needed. So if the auditorium fills up in one of our services, somebody from our hospitality team will guide you to a place where there is overflow seating. Now, the question that seems to be on everybody's minds these days, are we going to require masks? The short answer to that question is yes, we are going to require masks. We, we know that people have different views on this. And again, we've made this decision out of a desire to do our best to protect one another and also to give us the best chance at being able to continue to do what we desire to do in there. So we are requiring face masks in the building at all times with three exceptions. First of all, there's an exception for nursery and toddler age children. Second of all, there's an exception for the main teacher in each age group 
during the time that they're teaching and the vocalists on stage during singing. We want our teachers and our singers to be able to lead us with expression. And finally, during each service, we have set aside one of our video overflow rooms as a mask optional location. For those who can't tolerate a mask medically, or for those who just feel very, very strongly about not wearing one, you can go into that room, take off your mask while you're there, and watch the service. We'll just ask you to put it back on when you leave, and, and to keep in mind that there will be space limited in that room, and it will be on a first-come, first-serve basis. So again, we realize that this is not going to suit everyone's preferences, and nobody likes doing these things. But we need to pray that this is only for a short time and that God will allow our church to bear with these things with, with his help and, and with one another. Finally, will we be celebrating communion together? The answer to that is yes. In fact, we're going to do that next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be an awesome service together. Uh, uh, and uh, then we're going to pick it back up on a regular monthly schedule, first Sunday of each month beginning in November. Instead of celebrating it the first Sunday in October, we're going to do it next Sunday instead, our first time back together. It's going to look a little bit different. Communion is going to be distributed in individual packages, which you can pick up on your way in. We'll explain that to you when you, when you get there. For those of you who are going to be participating online from home, what I really hope you will do is come to the building a little earlier in the week and you can pick up one of these passages and then you'll be able to join with us live online either at 9.30 or 11.15. So next week, services at 8 o'clock, 9.30, 11.15, or live online at 9.30 and 11.15. And I have to say, I, I, I know this is shared, it is going to be so good to get back into our building again. You might need to be a little bit patient with us next week as we figure all of this out. We've tried to anticipate how many people will come to different services, but it, it, it's hard, it's difficult for us to do that. Uh, we, though, are, are so looking forward to gathering together. We're so looking forward to not missing a beat this fall. But one uh, last thing, this is our final outdoor service. Uh, our tans as a church family are going to begin to fade soon. But I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being so flexible and participating. I know it has been really hot on some Sundays, and I know it, it, it was rainy on other Sundays. But I, I am so glad that people have been able to participate. I know not everybody can. I, I know it doesn't fit, you know, for, for every person. But I want to thank you for that. I want to thank the incredible volunteers who have done such great work with these services. Particularly, I want to thank the sound guys who were here at 6 a.m. every week lugging all of this equipment out here and who stayed until noon every day to lug it back into the building. I want to thank Josh Sampson for recording and editing video for us each week. He's done a tremendous job. I want to thank our facilities team for building this stage and the bridge and making sure the parking lot is marked. I want to thank our sound people for going through all of the difficulties that they faced in, in doing this. I want to thank our safety and security team for keeping us safe. Even this morning, we, they were so helpful to us. And I want to thank our hospitality team who has done such a wonderful job organizing these services and making them smooth and easy for us. It's like I said before, we have so many good people here. Ah, my heart just wants to burst in, in gratitude. But finally, the people I really want to thank most of all are our staff. Our staff has done a tremendous job. 
without a complaint, with attitudes of joy. We've all been trying to figure this out. The same thing is true with our elders. They've had meeting after meeting after meeting. And uh, I, I just appreciate the men and women that God has blessed us with as a, as a church family. Well, I love you. I appreciate you. I'm willing to stay here as late as you need. If you want to talk about any details of the plan or you have any uh, comments that you want to give, I'll try to stick around until everybody's gone today. And uh, as our friend has said, go in grace. And don't be afraid to serve the Lord without fear.